Good afternoon. We might get started. My name is Jane Brown and I'm an anaesthetist at Westmead Hospital in Sydney. On behalf of the Obstetric SIG Committee, I'd like to warmly welcome you to this session entitled Safety Issues in Obstetric Anaesthesia. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr David Bogod, who after several fantastic talks so far this weekend, needs little introduction. With a special interest in obstetric anaesthesia, risk management and medico-legal matters, he's ideally placed to talk to us on safety issues. Please welcome Dr David Bogod to speak on keeping it clean, antisepsis and the neuraxis. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Here we are again. <laughs> Ah, well, thank you very much for asking me to talk on this, uh, on this subject, which is very close to my heart uh, and your backs. It, it, it occurred to me that um, I haven't put up a, a conflict of interest slide, and actually I do have a little conflict of interest here, uh, which is a serious one, actually. I have been entertained by the manufacturers of chloroprep, which is a 2% chlorhexidine stick, of which I will be speaking. You'll notice that the entertainment they gave me has not in any way uh, altered my view of chloroprep, as you will see as time goes on. Um, and also I do, do medico-legal work uh, and uh, therefore come across some cases of uh, arachnoiditis which might or might not be related to, uh, to antiseptics. So having said that, the history of all this is quite interesting, so please bear with me for a moment or two while I take us back to two years before I was born, 1955, um, when Weston Hurst uh, decided he wanted to look uh, at uh, detergents and other chemical irritants and see what effects they had upon the arachnoid membranes. Um, so he took a, a bunch of monkeys and injected into their cisterna magna a number of substances. Um, and here they were. He didn't name them all, and we've no idea what all of them were, but cetramide you will recognize as, as being uh, what we call uh, povidone, in povidone iodine. Um, and the one at the bottom... 1,6-di4-chloro-phenyl-diguanidohexane uh, diacetate, oh, I'll never do that again, uh, is now, thank goodness, known as chlorhexidine. Uh, so it's interesting to look back at his work. And what he found, uh, he injected uh, this stuff into the cisterna magna and then sacrificed the monkeys later, and 0.02% chlorhexidine produced microscopic changes uh, the 0.05%, um, which is a pretty low concentration, produced death of the uh, monkey within seven days with dilated ventricles. And 0.1% produced death of 48 hours after fitting. Uh, this is a pretty nasty substance when it comes into contact with nerve tissue. The changes were, were, were the, 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 the pathology was uh, produced in three different ways. Firstly, by dire a direct effect on nervous tissue, and antiseptics, by virtue of their very nature, uh, tend to uh, cause cell death. Um, secondly, by cellular proliferation before that death occurred, uh, causing inflammation of the meninges and blockage of CSF flow. And thirdly, by necrosis of the, uh, the media and adventitia of the blood vessels actually supplying the nervous tissue, the brain, uh, ca causing luminal obliteration and ischemia. So chlorhexidine has multiple effects upon uh, neurological tissue. Interestingly, while at it, um, povidone was also uh, uh, not to be trusted again, because it's an antiseptic and therefore kills cells. Uh, so one mil of 0.1% uh, injected into a monkey at day two to four produces mild anorexia, then recovery. Uh, but uh, the monkey then goes on to develop a, a hydrocephalic uh, adhesive arachnoiditis with weakness, rigidity, and tremor, uh, and death uh, somewhere around um, four to five weeks. Um, and again, it's dilated ventricles with adherent meninges, preventing CSF flow and causing hydrocephalus. Um, so that was 1955. Then in 1984, Henschen and Olsen decided to do uh, in vitro studies uh, uh, looking at the, um, the eye of a mouse. And they injected into the eye of a mouse a number of different solutions of chlorhexidine, tiny dose, five microliters. Uh, it's a pretty small eye, uh, different concentrations. Um, and looking at the effects specifically upon uh, the adrenergic nerve. So here they are looking at... Looking at sympathetic parasympathetic, the, the autonomic nervous system primarily. And 0.05% produces about 30% destruction of adrenergic nerves, but at all other concentrations, you get complete obliteration of all adrenergic nerves very quickly. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is chlorhexidine is a nasty substance when it comes to nerves. Now, I teased some of you with a picture of this lady uh, earlier today. This is uh, Angelique Sutcliffe. 
Now, Angelique, uh, at the age of 32, underwent a second caesarean section, electively under spinal anesthesia, at a hospital in the United Kingdom. Um, she received a straightforward and simple spinal dose of 0.5% hyperbaric bupivacaine with nothing added to it. After preparation of her back with both chlorhexidine and povidone iodine, rather unusually, um, it was a bit difficult to do the spinal, so they had two goes at it. Um, and during the procedure, she got a perfectly good block, but during the procedure she got very restless, so much so they had to give her a general anaesthetic. And when she uh, recovered rather slowly from the general anaesthetic, uh, she wasn't able to pass urine, uh, not only for the first 24 hours, as is quite common after section, but uh, for, days, for days afterwards. And she ended up going home at about seven days self-catheterizing. She was then readmitted uh, with um, uh, tingling and numbness in her legs. They didn't really know what to make of her and sent her home. And then she, she was readmitted two days after that uh, with uh, significant mood changes, confusion, uh, distress, and they thought she had uh, a, a puerperal psychosis. But uh, eventually they discovered that she had raised intracranial pressure. Um, uh, se um, uh, serial MRI scans showed that her spinal cord had become uh, extremely adhesive at the bottom end, that it had started to split, that she had developed uh, an adhesive arachnoiditis going right up the cord that was then preventing flow of CSF from the third and fourth ventricles. And she had several shunt procedures uh, over the next few months and ended up uh, completely paraplegic and wheelchair bound. And needless to say, the press picked up on this. This was back in uh, 2002, I think. Uh, and uh, they were predicting how much money she would get in damages, and she did get a substantial amount in damages in the end. Um, several medical legal experts were instructed by the claimant in this case. I was the first. Um, and I said, I have no idea what's caused this. It looks like perhaps it's some, some sort of contamination, but I certainly can't demonstrate that's the case. That if you look at the technique that the anaesthetist used, it seems perfectly acceptable technique. Uh, I can't find they've done anything wrong. And if they haven't done anything wrong, however damaged she is, she's not going to win any, any damages. Um, and the second expert said the same thing, and so did the third. And they came to a fourth expert in the end who decided that it was uh, chlorhexidine contaminant. Chlorhexidine must have contaminated the syringe of local anaesthetic. And there was some debate in court as to whether this was the case. And then the night, uh, during the one night while the trial was going on, he sat at his kitchen table, poured a little pour, uh, pool of chlorhexidine on the table and dropped a syringe into it and, de and demonstrated to his own satisfaction that chlorhexidine was drawn up by capillary action into the, uh, into the lure uh, um, uh, opening of the syringe so, uh, and then went back and told the judge the next day and the judge decided this was sufficient to find that there had been chlorhexidine contamination and awarded a large amount of money to Angelique Suckley uh, and she thoroughly deserved it. But of course scientifically the whole process was a bit iffy and I said as much in a rather uh, a rather cocky uh, piece of, uh, of journalism in anaesthesia news at the time, in which I quoted um, Donald Rumsfeld about known knowns and unknown knowns and all the rest of it. Uh, and I said at the end of this article, we don't know what happened to Angelique Sutcliffe, but at least now we know we don't know. So just because the judge had found it was chlorhexidine, I thought, well, that's a load of nonsense. We, can't, we cannot be sure of that. It could be some sort of hypersensitivity reactions, maybe, maybe even nothing to do with the spinal at all. Uh, but of course I was wrong, probably wrong, because this is a lady you will recognize, this is Grace, uh, Grace Wang, uh, who um, had an epidural while in labor in Sydney. Um, and we know what happened in Grace's case. Uh, chlorhexidine had been poured into a pot on the, uh, on, on, on the sterile tray. The chlorhexidine was used uh, in, in error instead of saline to locate and flush the epidural space. And we know she received a dose of, I think, about six mils of 0.5% chlorhexidine injected directly down the epidural needle into the, the epidural space. So, Angelique, we didn't know what happened. In Grace's case, we know exactly what happened. But the point is that Grace went on to develop exactly the same symptoms and progression, pathological progression, uh, as uh, Angelique had done before her. Uh, and this certainly provided some considerable uh, good objective evidence that chlorhexidine might have been what caused the trouble uh, in, Angelique's, uh, in Angelique's case, and that I'd been completely wrong. Uh, and I'm very happy. And this is Grace uh, now, what she, what she looks like after uh, um, she's paraplegic as well. The steroid treatment is the effect you see there. And obviously her life has been completely devastated. Um, 
And where do you go from there, really? Well, in a, uh, an article in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, um, Hebel pointed out that neither chlorhexidine nor povidone was approved by the FDA, and that povidone was less effective than chlorhexidine in general, because this was the debate at the time, should we move away from chlorhexidine? Uh, for a number of reasons, povidone was not the way to go. Uh, and ASRA uh, uh, ended up recommending in regional anesthesia and pain medicine that alcohol-based chlorhexidine solutions should be the antiseptic of choice before regional anesthetic techniques with grade A evidence. Um, then this stuff came along. Well, this, this stuff was around anyway, of course. Chlor chloroprep, I, I'm sure you've got it here as well. It's a 2% it's a uh, chlorhexidine solution in 70% alcohol contained within a hollow handle uh, which uh, within a, there's gla a glass ample within the hollow handle. There's two wings which then break the glass ample. The chlorhexidine uh, uh, soaks down onto the swab, which is then applied to the skin. Um, so it's a relatively contained system, except to note that within the handle, there is a hole, a drain hole, which allows air in, which then allows the chlorhexidine onto the sponge. And if you hold it upside down, chlorhexidine can drip from the handle onto your glove. So it's just something to be aware of. Anyway, this is the 2%, the, the only solution that comes with it is 2% uh, chlorhexidine and 70% alcohol. Uh, and this is the data sheet and the patient information sheet that came with the original solution. And they both say, do not use on lumbar puncture uh, where a needle is inserted to the small of your back. That seems pretty straightforward. So if you were using that for spinal anesthesia, you would certainly be breaking the product license. Um, then they produced a new version of it, which was tinted, so you could see where it had been applied, because the old stuff didn't have a tint in it. Now it's got a, an orange tint. Uh, and as if by magic, uh, these two documents had changed very slightly, and now they said not to be brought into contact with neural tissue, uh, for example, brain and spinal cord tissue, which is somewhat different in not to be used for lumbar puncture, but it's exactly the same stuff. And it's the only stuff they make. They don't make 0.5%. They only make 2%. Um, now, uh, adhesive arachnoiditis is very unpleasant. So uh, what you see here is a, an axial cross-section of the corda equina, uh, uh, a normal corda equina, and you see those little dotty things down there, little, lots of little black dots. Those are the, uh, the individual nerve roots floating through the corda equina. And the next two um, uh, clips are both taken from a particular patient who has suffered severe adhesive arachnoiditis. Uh, and you can see apart from the fact they look as if they're smiling, which is rather unfortunate, uh, the way the nerve roots have been clumped together, and it's a very, uh, it really is a very different uh, appearance, and it's quite specific for an adhesive inflammatory condition of this nature. Uh, where did that leave us? Uh, in 2012, uh, I wrote an editorial because I've been concerned, along with another, uh, a, a number of other medico-legal experts, that there were quite a few cases like Angelique in the pipeline. Everyone knew about Angelique, but nobody knew about the other ones. Uh, so I described uh, a further four cases, all of whom had had uh, a remarkably similar clinical course with progressive leg weakness and pain, hydrocephalus, serial shunts leading to paraplegia. And on top of those, seven other cases uh, which have gone part of the way down that process but not got as far as needing shunt surgery. Uh, all of which look like they may well be contamination of the neuraxis by chlorhexidine. Um, and I kind of left it at that other than saying we really need to be very c careful with this chlorhexidine stuff. Uh, and at the same time, other things were going on. And um, further work was going on using neuronal and Schwann cells uh, in uh, regional anesthesia and pain medicine. And this particularly looked at two things. First of all, it looked at chlorhexidine versus povidone and its effect upon neuronal tissue. Uh, and actually, although it looks there as if the chlorhexidine is less lethal to cells than the, than the chlorhexidine, the povidones are more da sorry, less dangerous than the chlorhexidine, in fact it isn't. And what's going on here is that the equipotent concentrations with regard to antisepsis produce pretty equivalent cell death rates. And the other thing they looked at is they took some pig skin uh, and they, passed, uh, they, they painted it with chlorhexidine, 2% chlorhexidine, allowed it to dry, passed a spinal needle through it, um, uh, a 22-gauge quinky needle containing one mil of local anesthetic, cut off the tip of the needle after it had passed through, washed it, and then analyzed the amount of chlorhexidine on the tip and showed that actually it was very, very little indeed, the equivalent of 0.0001372%. So allowing chlorhexidine to dry, even 
appear to, you know, to, to, to mean that you'd carried very little chlorhexidine across the skin on the tip of your needle. Um, at the same time, there was some clinical work going on, and um, this group, uh, who had been using 2% chlorhexidine for spinal anesthetics for years and years and years without any complications at all, took exception to the idea that chlorhexidine could cause damage. And so they just went back through their data and said, have any of our patients had any neurological damage at all? We've been using 2% for a very long time. And they only came up with one, two, three, four, five patients. And you can see, actually, that they didn't really uh, produce, uh, even these patients didn't get what you would, might consider to be major neurological damage, most of them recovering within seven days, one 10 days, and one 30 days, with general sort of paresthesia, a bit of numbness, prolonged blocks, nothing very exciting at all. And because of the very large number of patients that they'd used the 2% chlorhexidine on, they were able to report that this was a 0.04% incidence of any neurological complications of any sort at all with spinal anesthesia. So that's 2012. Um, and so I've come to the present day, uh, and um, I was sitting in my hotel room <laughs> yesterday thinking it's about time the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland produced that safety guideline on skin antisepsis for central neuraxial blockade. I've been sitting on that working party for a year and a half now, and I thought we produced a version which was fine, and then it went for consultation and it went back. Uh, and it's about time it was up there, isn't it? So I went on the website, and there it was. It's not on the association website. So if you want to get this document, and you really ought to get this document if you're interested in this subject, you need to go to the um, Anesthesia Journal website, uh, which is easy to get to, just do a, a, a Google search on Anesthesia Journal. Um, there's a section called Early View, which has the papers which haven't yet been published in print, but which are available online. And this paper is one of those, and it is available uh, completely open access. So I could just shut up at this point, but I won't. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this is now the official document for the United Kingdom on skin antisepsis for central neuraxial blockade. And you can see it was put together by four uh, reputable bodies, the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain, the Obstetric Anesthetists Association, of which I was president at the time, Regional Anesthesia United Kingdom, and the Association of Pediatric Anesthetists. And the last name on that list of membership of the working party is a, a pathologist with a special interest in skin antisepsis uh, who does a lot of academic work. So it's quite a, it was a pretty reputable body. So this is the latest, uh, and I'll quickly run you through it. Um, it deals with each one of these topics in turn uh, with an awful lot of references to an awful lot of journals. So I'll just briefly mention them. First of all, it deals with chlorhexidine versus povidone iodine and confirms that clinically there's very good work that, that absolutely confirms that chlorhexidine is a far better antiseptic than povidone iodine, particularly with regard to its, uh, the maintenance of asepsis and antisepsis around indwelling catheters. It then deals with aqueous versus alcoholic chlorhexidine, because after all there's the question of alcohol as well and confirms that alcoholic chlorhexidine is needed. You need the 70% alcohol to work with the chlorhexidine, partly for degreasing the skin and partly because it has antiseptic properties of its own. It then deals with the knotty question of 0.5% versus 2% chlorhexidine, uh, which has caused quite a lot of controversy in the working party uh, because there's not, not every country has got 0.5%. So in the United States, they pretty well only use 2% chlorhexidine, and I don't know what the situation is in here. But what little work is available comparing the two suggests that 2% has little, if any, added if effect over and above the 0.5%. Then speaks of chlorhexidine, alcohol, and neurotoxicity, just reporting the kind of cases that I've described already, uh, and also pointing out that alcohol is used for neurolysis and so it does carry some impact of its own. Uh, it talks of method of application. Um, and feels there's still some work to be done on this, but points out that uh, uh, what you really don't want to be doing is pouring it into an open, open pot on your sterile tray, perhaps unsurprisingly. You want to avoid splashes. You want to make sure it's applied uh, evenly and effectively to the skin and that it's allowed to dry. Um, and it doesn't decry the use, for example, of a, of a spray, a spray bottle, uh, as long as you keep the spray away from your equipment and your drugs. Uh, it goes on to speak of chlorhexidine in children. The data sheet says it shouldn't be used in children under the age of two. 
this is all related to absorption of chlorhexidine across the skin and plasma levels of chlorhexidine, and actually they're pretty low even in, even in uh, preterm babies, uh, and it's more about using the smallest amount you can get away with. Allergic reactions to chlorhexidine, which are less than allergic reactions to povidone, uh, but do still occur, and they include uh, and go up to um, anaphylaxis. The importance of other infection control precautions, uh, such as a good sterile technique, and uh, whether this can be extended for peripheral nerve blocks as well. So there's a lot of stuff in there, and it's all referenced. Um, and they come up with a number of recommendations, which I shall point to you. First of all, that uh, whatever you do with regard to antisepsis, central, nerves, central neural blockage should be the subject of optimal aseptic technique, by which they mean um, a proper scrub, a hat, a mask, gown, gloves, antiseptic preparation, and a sterile drape. They do say, we do say, I helped write it, we do say that we are aware that not everybody follows these precautions, but we just sort of leave it like that. Um, it then recommends, specifically recommends, 0.5% chlorhexidine in alcohol as a preparation that should be used for central, nerve, central neural blockade. So it does come down firmly on that side. Um, it then goes on to talk specifically, provide recommendations about prevention of contamination of the equipment and drugs in the field. So obviously, keeping your source bottle and anything that's been poured well away from drugs and equipment, and particularly not having a, a galley pot of open fluid on the same surface as the, as the equipment, uh, not pouring it into a container on or close to the equipment tray, uh, during application, particularly if you're using a spray application, having the equipment actually physically covered, allowing the skin to dry fully, and then a final visual check for glove contamination. I've, I've, I've been doing this for years, and it's amazing how often at least my gloves get contaminated with a little with a drop or two of fluid. Uh, perhaps I'm not very good at doing it. Uh, and um, we then go on to say, uh, in contrast to the, uh, uh, to the data sheet, that in children under two months, it's still the best antiseptic to use, and it's, it's still its use... Um, uh, the advantages outweigh the risks that you should carry on using it in children under two months, but keep the, the volume down to a minimum. And actually what I haven't put here is it also goes on to say, uh, with regard to a peripheral nerve blockade, that they would say the same things apply, essentially. With, there's, there's, there's less evidence. We haven't got any specific cases of nerve damage as a result of contamination with, with chlorhexidine, but it makes sense that the same precaution should apply and you should still use 0.5% if possible, which is going to cause a great deal of upset with my regional anaesthetic colleagues, all of whom use 2% chlorhexidine sticks at the moment. Um, finally, it leaves some questions that are still open for research, so if any of you want to start a, a little research uh, project. Um, we don't know how long the antimicrobial activity of an application of 0.5% chlorhexidine lasts in alcohol, uh, and we don't know if it's specifically if it's considerably or significantly less time than the duration of 2%. So that's a question that remains open to a certain extent, and some work needs to be done on that. Um, the su surgeons, the surgeons you work with, the surgeons I work with, probably don't realize they're doing it, but they use an apply-wipe, apply technique, or some do, where you apply your antiseptic, physically wipe it off, and then apply some more antiseptics. See, some surgeons do. This does have some advantages in that it degreases the skin specifically because bacteria can be, can be found five skin cell layers deep to the skin, uh, a staph um, epidermidis. And by using a wipe technique with the first application to get rid of the dead skin cells on the surface, you may well improve the antimicrobial environment. Uh, we don't know that for sure yet. And... We also felt that more work needs to be done, probably in vitro, on the neurological damage uh, produced by 0.5% versus 2% versus alcohol, so we know where we really are with that. So that's where the situation now lies as of today, um, and I do recommend you go and get those guidelines. They are well worth a read, uh, and if not, or if you want a copy of the, uh, uh, of the lecture, please email me at that address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would ask uh, that we're going to have all the questions together at the end of the session. Uh, please feel free to submit questions via the app in the meantime. So our second speaker is Dr David Elliott, who's also like me from Westmead in Sydney, where he's been a senior staff specialist for 15 years.
while he has a diverse practice in both public and private hospitals, it's fair to say that at Westmead he has transformed obstetric anaesthesia from a state of mind to a core subspecialty group. Through his role in the ASA, he contributes his enthusiasm and expertise to many meetings. I'd like you to welcome Dr. David Elliott to talk about neuraxial anaesthesia, making the right connection. Thank you very much, Jane. I'll just uh, plug this in. I'm assured that this will, uh, presentation will come up seamlessly. I get nervous at this point. Okay, well, thanks again, um, Jane, to, to, and to the organisers of this meeting for asking me to talk today and also to the special interest group. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today on uh, neuraxial equipment, making the right connection. It's a beautiful um, actual segue from what uh, David's just been talking about, and there's a little bit of overlap, unfortunately, uh, not too much overlap. Uh, of course, uh, as always these days, we uh, have to put in a declaration of interest, and I'm happy to say I have no declaration of interest uh, save I have been talking to the manufacturers at B. Braun who manufacture our epidural equipment quite a bit over the last 12 months um, about something that I'll cover later on and I have on two occasions received a bottle of mineral water from them which I have consumed. So what, what's the problem? Um, well, fundamentally what, what I want to talk about is the wrong stuff ending up in the epidural or intrathecal space. And, and, and there's stuff that's meant to go in there, and of course there's stuff that's not meant to go in there. So what are the sort of types of errors that can happen? Well, first of all, you can have contamination uh, of, the epi of the neuraxial space, either the epidural space or the subarachnoid space, um, uh, with neurotoxic agents either at a microscopic level or a macroscopic level, a gross contamination level, and I'll come back and talk about that in a moment. Um, solutions that we intend for the epidural or, or uh, spinal space can be contaminated with pathogens. W really, that comes down to education and good antiseptic uh, technique that uh, David's just been talk talking about. There can be ampule error, uh, which is just reading, misreading the ampule and drawing up the wrong drug. Again, there are systems that can be put in place to reduce that, and there's also some terrible traps that are put in our way every now and again that make it more likely. And I'm sure you've all, all experienced a situation where uh, unilaterally a pharmacy department has found a cheaper version of a drug and suddenly an ampule of the drug appears on your trolley that looks just like another ampule that you were using the week before, it's just that it was of a drug that is not actually intended for the epidural space or, or spinal space. Syringe swaps can occur uh, and there are systems that we can put in place to try and avoid that. Um, and the, uh, a big one, though, that has really caused terrible morbidity and mortality over the years is the confusion between drugs that are intended for the neuraxial space being inadvertently given down an intravenous line and vice versa. It tends not to happen uh, with subarachnoid injection, but there are many, many cases over the past few decades of uh, drugs intended for the uh, intravenous lines being given down uh, epidural catheters. And finally, there's something that we really don't have a lot of um, control over because it happens at the back office level, if you like, and that's pharmaceutical mislabelling, either of pre-filled syringes uh, or of ampules, and there's not a lot we can uh, do about that, and that comes down to quality control at that level. So just to give a couple of examples, I'm sure um, you are uh, very familiar or certainly heard about the very famous um, Woolley versus Roe case. This, um, this was a case that was heard in the High Courts of England uh, by Justice Hewitt in 1953, and it involved uh, two patients, um, uh, Cecil Rowe and uh, someone, Woolley, whose name I've forgotten, who were two youngish patients, aged 56 and 45, respectively, and they were both anaesthetised uh, by the same anaesthetist, the same surgeon on the same list on the same day in 1947. And they both developed a progressive, painful, permanent quarter equina syndrome. And uh, the case was brought to court in 1953, was heard over uh, 10 days. And ultimately, even though these men had suffered terrible, permanent, catastrophic consequences, um, the judge actually ruled that um, although phenol was the likely contaminant, 
of the new procaine, which was the local anaesthetic that was used, which is dibucaine, uh, and it was likely that the phenol had entered those ampules through microscopic cracks uh, because the new procaine ampules were sterilised by being um, soaked in, uh, in phenol solution uh, for a number of hours prior to the anaesthetic. Despite the fact that that was the ruling, uh, the case was dismissed because it was considered that in the eyes of a 1947 competent anaesthetist, that was not something that would have been expected. So it was very unfortunate for the two gentlemen, but the case was dismissed. However, it did go on to have um, very widespread and, and far-reaching ramifications. Uh, spinal anaesthesia in the UK was pretty much on the nose for a couple of decades after that, which you can understand, both from anaesthetists and, uh, and patients, and, uh, and the popularity of spinal anaesthesia really uh, went, uh, went down a lot. However, it, it gradually regained traction, and if you think that it uh, would never have happened again, uh, in 2012, there was a case report in anaesthesia of a 27-year-old woman in New Zealand who was undergoing a routine caesarean section. Interestingly, skin prep with the, not with that particular brand name, but with the 2% chlorhexidine and alcohol. Um, apparently well documented, apparently very competently, appropriately performed spinal. But she went on to uh, develop a progressive paraplegia. Uh, from adhesive arachnoiditis and the, the only conclusion was that there was some microscopic contamination probably of the intrathecal space by the 2% chlorhexidine. And um, the um, authors concluded, um, amongst other things, uh, their main one of their main conclusions was a black box. I'll just read that in case it doesn't come up. Uh, one of their main conclusions was that they, they, they speculated that there may be a subgroup of patients who were emerging who were prone to develop severe neurological symptoms relatively rapidly within weeks or months of central neuraxial an anaesthesia in response to blood, perhaps local anaesthetics, or traces of contaminants. And um, oh, there it is up there, so perhaps traces of, of contaminants. And both that recent case on a, on a, on a microscopic level and the, the terrible, tragic case uh, that occurred in Sydney in 2010 that David talked about, so I won't go into that in any more detail, of Grace Wang, where a, a macroscopic gross contamination of the epidural space uh, occurred with chlorhexidine, has informed our practice such that I, I would like to think that this is a problem that that would not happen again because we are so conscious of this now and we are very careful to uh, keep our chlorhexidine skin sterilising solution separate from our setup and try and avoid this microscopic contamination and certainly the gross contamination that occurred, uh, occurred there. So that's, the, that's c contamination by, particularly by chlorhexidine. But as I said, there's other, there's other forms of, uh, of error that can occur, again, with tragic consequences. Um, and uh, this was what really triggered uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, which is trying to avoid misconnection of uh, epidural and, and spinal components. And that was a, that was a, a case that um, occurred very close to Dr. Bogood's um, hospital, in his hospital, uh, in um, 2000 and uh, occurred um, to a young man who was 19 years old, uh, Matthew Jowett, I think his name was. He had a curable haematological malignancy, acute uh, lymphocytic leukaemia or lymphoblastic leukaemia, I think. Uh, and he was admitted to the day chemotherapy unit uh, on the 7th of January 2000, and, uh, 2000 for administration, routine administration of prophylactic vincristine intravenously. Through a series of terrible and tragic errors, that drug was actually administered intrathecally. He went on uh, and subsequently died a month later um, in the early hours of the morning on the 2nd of February. And that then triggered a, um, uh, a, obviously a lot of soul searching and uh, a review by Professor Brian Toft. And it turns out that there have been 13 cases in the literature in the UK of, of vincristine inadvertently being administered intrathecally, resulting in 10 deaths. And, um, and as a result of that, a series of recommendations were, making, were made, uh, including such system-based changes uh, that the recommendation was made that non-Lua connectors, as in connectors that will not fit a normal Lua-type syringe, should be introduced in practice, particularly for the administration of intrathecal uh, chemo uh, chemotherapeutic agents. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in a little while. 
And if you look through the lit if you look through the literature, I'm not going to go through each of these cases, but uh, there's been pretty much anything you can possibly imagine has been uh, accidentally injected down epidural catheters, uh, epidural potassium chloride, accidental epidural thiopentone, accidental uh, epidural methohexatone. Uh, there's been uh, new, um, uh, high pressure air lines connected up to epidural catheters. Uh, th there's, there's a whole lot of pretty scary stuff out there that you can look up on YouTube of where, of where uh, misconnections have been, uh, have been made. And it ranges from relatively benign substances, fortunately thiopentone and, and, um, and uh, the uh, antibiotics like uh, uh, chloramphen... Um, chlor Kef uh, what do we use? Kefzol. Kefzol. Are relatively benign through to incredibly neurotoxic agents uh, have been injected. So we have to do something to try and solve this. So what's the solution? There's quite a, a very neat paper that was written a few years ago in 2003 by Alan Sinner um, and Scott Simmons from um, Women's and Children in Adelaide. And they reviewed 35 years of the literature from 1966 to 2002. They also looked at the AIMS reports um, and the US closed claims data. And they retrieved 31 case reports of 37 events, which generated 49 separate incidents of non-epidural drugs being administered into the epidural space. There's more incidents than there were reports because uh, some, involved some of the events involved multiple um, incidents. And the authors ascribed the various incidents to one of four categories, very similar to the ones that I had up before, syringe swap, ampule error, epidural intravenous line confusion and incorrect preparation of, of the infusion solution at a pharmacy level. And they, they suggested that of those 49 um, uh, errors, drug administration errors into the neuraxial space, 31 were where non-Lua couplings would probably have prevented the error from occurring. So this sounds like a pretty good idea on the face of it. And that's, uh, that's um, uh, the, uh, the, the current Lua fitting, which is a 6% Lua taper, which was first described uh, by a German someone. I've lost all my speaker notes at the bottom here. Uh, it was a Ger Lud Ludwig van Lua, I think his name was, in the, in the 19th century. This is all your fault, by the way, Dr. Bogart, because last night I went home and changed all my slides over to Keynote at midnight, thanks to you. But fortunately, it's all in here, so we're okay. So anyway, so this Lua, this Lua uh, taper has, is, is, um, is defined by the International Standards Organization and is the, the same, same Lua fitting in every bit of kit that we use across the world. However, as a result of that uh, Toft inquiry, um, and it was, it was suggested and then started to be mandated by the National Patient Safety Agency in the UK that, that they should go down the path of non-Lua connectors, um, fitting such of these started coming out. And this is manufactured by Smith's Medical. And this is a, this is, these are non-Lua connectors. So they may look like they would fit a standard syringe, but in fact, they, they don't. So none of those components, they will all interchange with each other to, to administer, in this case, a spinal anaesthetic, but they will not be interchangeable with any other syringe or needle or catheter or cannula that we use. Sounds great, but there are, there are some caveats. And you can see there on the, on the left, that's a standard lure fitting, and fractionally smaller on the right is the Smith's non-lure fitting. Just the problem is, is there's no international standard. So Smith's make this, and then Braun came up with one, and Verjunk came up with another one. And so at one stage, I think it's not the case at the moment, but at one stage there were six different manufacturers in the UK producing six slightly different uh, non-lure fittings, none of which were interchanged with each other. Just imagine doing a, an epidural or a spinal and, and, you know, in that sort of situation. So will these non-lure non equipment fix all problems? And unfortunately, the answer is no. It will decrease or eliminate wrong route or wrong drug administration, particularly if you had pre-filled syringes sent up from pharmacy. Great for something like uh, intrathecal uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Not so good for anaesthetists where, where you know, not one size fits all. It will not prevent, they will not prevent human errors of wrong drug selection, contamination of drug or either gross or microscopic uh, with our chlorhexidine solution, wrong drug prescription or transcription errors. 
So you could say, well, in that case, why change? If, if, if the non-lure fittings don't solve all the problems, why change? Well, that's a bit like the, the gun lobby used the same argument, of course. The gun lobby say, why should you have any gun control at all? Because, uh, because if you control guns, it won't help, because uh, it's not the guns that are killing people, it's the people that kill people. And, of course, you can come back with quite a neat argument against that. Uh, and I think it's the same for the non-lure fittings, that, um, that, that because a system is not perfect, doesn't mean that it's not a good idea and won't prevent some errors. And we're very familiar uh, in both our working and our domestic lives with fittings of things, of stuff, that we can't put in, in the wrong place. So we're all quite happy that our um, electric plugs, uh, you can't plug the earth into the active and vice versa. We're all quite happy uh, that for the most, although, although it's not fail safe, it's pretty hard to put the wrong type of fuel uh, into, into your car. Not impossible, but pretty hard. It's impossible to plug the wrong seatbelt in the back seat to the wrong, to the wrong, um, the wrong seatbelt uh, coupling. It's hard, not impossible, hard to put your car into reverse when you're, uh, when you're batting down the freeway at 100 kilometres an hour. Um, we are very happy that we have sleeve indexes on our gas hoses and no one would even dream of not having a specific uh, gas hose that was, that was um, coupling specific to that type of gas. The, uh, the uh, ophthalmologists on their FACO machines, they have six different outlets for vacuum, FACO, uh, irrigation. They're all specific, so you can't interchange one from another. We're very familiar with the uh, Selector Tech vaporizers, so you can't interchange them. And yet, for some reason, we accept that we can still do this which I think does seem extraordinary when you think about it, and the non-lure fittings, you could argue, would uh, help that. However, I'm now going to be the devil's advocate because I think the time is not yet right for non-lure neuraxial connections for a number of reasons. First of all, there's no ISO standard in place, so the International Standards Organisation is working on this at the moment. There is a document um, out for public comment where uh, they have come up with suggested guidelines for it. It'll probably take a few years to work through the system. In, in the meantime, manufacturers are free to uh, manufacture whatever they, whatever they like, uh, and there are multiple manufacturers with multiple tapers in place. I would also argue that there is, unless you have a full complement of neuraxial kit, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go down this process. So it may work perfectly well if you have a straightforward spinal and everything goes swimmingly well, or if you have an epidural and everything goes well. But what about if you have an epidural and you have an accidental dural puncture and the next day you have to come and do a blood patch? If, do you then have a syringe and a needle that will allow you to take blood? And then you've got to remember at some stage, somewhere in the world, that syringe and that needle or that IV cannula that you're using to take the blood will end up on an emergency trolley at an arrest situation and someone will go to give adrenaline or atropine or whatever uh, to a patient in cardiac arrest and they won't, it won't fit. So I, I would argue that that, uh, that, that it remains an, an unresolved issue. Uh, the UK, in the UK, the, um, the, uh, a, the uh, patient safety agency uh, has actually been closed down, presumably due to lack of funding, and has been uh, absorbed back into the NHS. And this is current. Um, the NHS says that because full compliance with the previous alerts from 2009 and 2011, which mandated the introduction of this non-lure technology, because um, there were, it wasn't currently possible, because of the, not all the kits are available, that they weren't going to mandate that this should be introduced for uh, anaesthesia, although I believe it has been mandated for chemotherapeutic agents intrathecally, and we could talk about that in the questions. So I think it is, it's too early to introduce it, in my, in my opinion. However, there is something we can do that I think is very simple, uh, which is not that simple as it turns out, but it's very cheap, should be fairly simple, and we have good evidence for it, and that is colour coding of syringes, and we're very familiar with this in this country, so about 15 or, probably 15 or 18 years ago, we switched from, for giving muscle relaxants, from normal clear syringes to red plunger syringes, and almost overnight, the most significant uh, anaesthetic uh, drug error, namely of the interchange of midazolam for, as a pre-med for the local anaesthetic at that time, vecuronium, which was the most common anaesthetic drug error, disappeared overnight. 
Um, and uh, Alan, Mary, um, and Jenny Weller from uh, Welling Wellington, Auckland, and Auckland and Wellington, um, looked at this in a um, in a large uh, analysis of 94 papers um, back in 2000. Don't know what year, 2012, I think it was in anaesthesia. And they looked at the evidence base for various strategies that could be used for minimising um, uh, drug swap errors in this situation. And uh, they, they came up with 12 recommendations, one of which was that colour coding by class of drug according to an agreed national or international standard should be used uh, of the syringe or part of the syringe. So I think we have good evidence that colour coding of syringes works very well in reducing drug error of this type. And I've been working in the last 12 months with, with I say, B. Braun, who happens to manufacture our epidural kits at Westmead. I have no financial interest in it, I should say. And we're just about to change over. It's a very simple change um, to colour, colour coding for any syringe where an agent will be uh, drawn up, either a loss of resistance saline or our local anaesthetic that's designed for the epidural space into a, ye a yellow plunger syringe. You'd actually think that would be dead simple. It's, in fact, it's taken nearly a year to source a supplier who can, who can do that. It, it's actually quite hard, uh, but we're just about to introduce that in the next couple of weeks. And likewise, um, we're going to uh, have a, a spinal kit um, with a five mil and a three mil syringe that we can use for, for spinal anaesthesia. Not hard, it's been well validated that it works, and I would argue maybe as effective or possibly even more effective and ultimately cause less problems than having non-Lua non specific technology. So finally, um, summing up, uh, there is a problem. Um, so we continue to have contamination uh, and the wrong stuff is going uh, in the, into the neuraxial spaces. We've got at least, at least a partial solution. Um, I, think we've, I think we've solved the chlorhexidine issue. I think through education and through, through system-based strategies, I think we have sorted that one out. And those guidelines are fantastic uh, and, and fortunately align very much with um, our practice in Australia. Uh, and I think the yellow plunger syringes has been um, well validated and the absence of an ISO standard, uh, I would argue that that is something that we should be adopting in this country. And my final message, don't put rat poison down epidurals. Thanks very much. Thank you, David, for a very uh, thought-provoking um, talk. As I say, please keep your questions coming in uh, through the app, um, and we'll get all the speakers up at the end. So our final speaker is Dr Naomi Chong. She's going to speak to us on type 1 diabetes and the obstetric anaesthetist. Naomi graduated from the University of Queensland and undertook her advanced training in endocrinology and obstetric medicine at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital. She currently works privately and is a VMO at the Redland Hospital in Endocrinology and Obstetric Medicine Clinic. Naomi has a particular interest in insulin requirements in type 1 diabetes during pregnancy and breastfeeding, which is the topic of her PhD. Her current research at the Royal Brisbane Women's and Martyrs Hospital explores the changes in glycemia that occurs during the peripartum period and breastfeeding and the factors that influence that. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you. I'm just going to adjust down being somewhat shorter than the other two speakers. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me to speak today. These are my disclosures, so some sponsorship as well as some funding. So the majority of the studies that I'm presenting today from our group were sponsored by the NHMRC as well as by the RBWH Foundation. So the outline of this talk, I'd firstly like to go through the maternal and fetal risk very briefly of type 1 diabetes in pregnancy and then deal with glycemia both in late gestation, peripartum period and then the postpartum setting. So the first one, so dealing with the risk of type 1 diabetes in pregnancy. So these maternal effects we know quite well. So these women carry a very high risk of preeclampsia. There's also the risk of worsening pre-existing microvascular complications, especially for this audience, that of nephropathy, but also of retinopathy, the onset of gastroparesis, um, and progression of a peripheral neuropathy. <clears throat> and some of this progression can actually be irreversible. There is an increase in infection rate as well as an increase in cesarean rate that's up to 60% in some centres. In terms of the fetal effects, we know that there are congenital anomalies that are associated with type 1 diabetes. 
uh, and this is very strongly related to the HbA1c at conception. So women who conceive with an A1c of less than 7% have a very comparable rate of congenital malformations, and that rises quite steeply. So that if your conception A1c is greater than 10%, you run the risk of about a 20 to 30% rate of congenital malformations. Uh, and there are the um, uh, problems with type 1 in pregnancy in terms of the fetus, as we know. There's an increased risk of perinatal and neonatal mortality, IUFD, and the fetal hyperinsulemia results in chronic fetal hypoxia, which can result in extramedullary hematopoiesis, polycythemia, jaundice, macrosomia, organomegaly, hypoglycemia, and polyhydramnios. So moving to the insulin requirements in late gestation. <coughs> During pregnancy, what we see is that most women demonstrate a marked increase in their insulin requirements um, compared to their pre-gestational requirements. And the most consistent change that we see is a rise in the second trimester. The beginning of pregnancy is a little bit more variable, and in certainly the older studies, they used to often suspect pregnancy in women when they had a sudden reduction in their insulin requirements, which usually coincided with being about 10 weeks pregnant. But usually from there on upwards, there's this increase in insulin resistance attributable to a post-receptor binding defect induced by the placental reproductive hormones, including human placental lactogen, progesterone, estrogen, as well as cortisol, prolactin, leptin, and possibly TNF-alpha. In late pregnancy, however, the situation is somewhat more variable. And so most women have a gradual, continual increase in their insulin requirements. Others have a plateau. But then some women have a fall. And so this is the period that I was most interested in. So only three studies have looked at the significance of what is a declining insulin requirements in late gestation. So historically, this used to provoke significant concern and often prompted obstetricians to say deliveries indicated in these women when their insulin requirements suddenly and unexpectedly dropped off because we were concerned about failure of the fetoplacental unit and possible impending or actual fetal death. The three studies that have looked at this, the first one was by McManus in 1992, and they involved 23 women. It was a retrospective study. And overall, they had a 5% fall in insulin requirements from 36 weeks until delivery. 62% of women, though, had a 12% decline in insulin, resist in insulin requirements, and 6% had a more than 15% decline. But there was no adverse fetal outcome noted in this study. A slightly later study, but a much larger study by Steele et al., showed relatively the similar thing, that 7% of women had a significant fall in their insulin requirements within the third trimester. And in five out of those 18 women, it was actually the prompt for delivery. But there was no adverse fetal outcome that was noted. And then finally, we reviewed our data at the Royal and at the Martin Mothers. And we had 59 women in our study. And of those, more than 15% had a, sorry, of those, 9% had a greater than 15% reduction in their insulin requirements. 40-odd percent of women remained stable, and the remaining, um, and a comparable amount also, had a slight rise in their insulin requirements. But again, there was no difference in fetal outcome, and we could find no difference in the maternal characteristics um, for those women who fell, stayed the same, or incremented in their insulin requirements. And so this, I think, is a big take-home message, that there is no adverse fetal outcome that has been noted in any of the data so far for these women who have a fall in their insulin requirements in late pregnancy. So even though, theoretically, this could represent failure of the fetal placental unit, it may also just represent a normal change in pregnancy. So what we certainly recommend is that, yes, bring these women in, do an ultrasound, do a do a CTG, but if there is no clear other indication for delivery, this alone should not prompt concern. So moving now to the peripartum management. So it's very well recognised, as I've mentioned, that antipartum glycemic control predicts neonatal outcome, including the risk of hypoglycemia. But it's not just antipartum, it's also in that immediate, immediate pre-delivery period. So a couple of these studies, one of this, the first one that I'll discuss is, is Miodovnik, and they showed no difference in the rate of neonatal hypoglycemia based on the method of delivery, but what they did show was that there was a significant correlation between the lowest infant plasma glucose in the four hours after birth and the highest maternal glucose within the four hours before delivery. <coughs> 
And these are, these are quite well-controlled women. So their cutoff was five millimoles, was their, their blood sugar level. So the rate of infant hypoglycemia in women who had a BGL of over five within four hours of delivery was almost 50%. Whereas those who had a BGL of less than five within the four hours of delivery had an infant rate of hypoglycemia of 14%. Seneca et al. also used a continuous glucose monitoring in this peripartum period. And they showed that the area under the curve and the mean glucose concentration the two hours before delivery was significantly associated with the need for IV glucose in the newborn. And mothers who, of infants who needed IV glucose had a higher mean glucose two hours before delivery than those who did not require IV glucose. And again, the sugars are not bad. So the, the difference between the two groups was 7.5 millimoles in one and 5.3 in the other. And the last study that's looked at this um, looked at their antipartum, so the, the, what is more predictive of neonatal hypoglycemia, and they had two variables. One was the prenatal, so the late pregnancy, two-hour postprandial glucose, and the other one was their glucose at the time of delivery. So it's not surprising that if you've got crap sugars at the end of pregnancy and you've got crap sugars at the time of delivery, you've got a high rate of neonatal hypoglycemia. And 71% was the numbers in this study. Similarly, if you're well controlled during the late pregnancy and well controlled at delivery, it was low, 10%. But what I think is interesting is these two spots in the middle. So if you were well controlled at the end of pregnancy, but badly controlled at the time of delivery, your rate of hypoglycemia for your infant was 43% compared with 16% in the converse. So it does matter. And my husband, who's an anaesthetist, and that's my anaesthetic connection, um, said to me, so should we really be delivering these women first on the list? And I think that that's actually an interesting point, that for elective caesareans, if women have really poorly controlled sugars the day of delivery or the day before delivery, and they can wait an extra day, it might not actually be a bad idea to hold these women over until the next day list, fix up their sugar control in that 24 hours, and then deliver them. Because we might be able to make a big difference on the rates of neonatal hypoglycemia. And that was his only contribution to this talk. Uh, <laughs> but a relevant one. Uh, and so glucose control in the hours prior to delivery is important, is my take home message here. So peripartum, what's happening? So in active labor, we get a fall in insulin requirements, which is coupled with increasing glucose demands because of the utiliz increased utilization of glucose as well as increased metabolic clearance. And postpartum, we see an abrupt reduction in those fetal placental hormones that drive insulin resistance, which results in a marked increase in insulin sensitivity, a reduction in insulin requirements, and the risk of hypoglycemia. And so this marks a real difference between your other patient populations. So normally, in a non-pregnant patient, or a pregnant patient that's not delivering, there is a marked increase in all those stress-related hormones, so they all become hyperglycemic post-operatively, and then I get a call from the surgeons telling me to fix their sugars post-op. But during labour and in the delivery setting, it's the extreme opposite. So these women actually have an increase of hypoglycemia, and that's something that, from, certainly from the obstetrician side of things, is not always very well recognised. So there are varied approaches to what the peripartum, how the peripartum period is managed. <clears throat> Majority of people would use an insulin dextrose infusion during active labour and fasting, but other things have been reported in the literature and they actually all have comparable um, uh, control. So subcut sliding scale with rotating IV fluids or a fixed dose of intermediate insulin. The pump patients is a bit of a difficult situation. And theoretically, we know that the basal rate for any type 1 diabetic is the amount of insulin they require to keep them euglycemic under normal conditions during fasting. So if you've got a type 1 patient who's fasting, theoretically they should just continue their pump. Um, and in this setting, we would stop their bolus dosing from the time of fasting and start a subcut infusion if their sugars are over eight and one would argue sometimes even over five. The option obviously is to stop the pump and just change the subcut insulin. And I have to say that the latter is what we tend to do at the Royal and at the Mata, um, and often because it's just of nursing comfortability and everyone is more comfortable not using a pump. So we just stop the pump rather than have people try to fiddle with it. And certainly our obstetricians are not comfortable with pumps. 
So this is what we do at the Royal as just one example. So women coming in for an elective caesarean or for an IOL with an um, artificial rupture of membranes, the night before they'd have their usual short-acting or rapid-acting insulin. They would generally have 75 to 100% of their intermediate-acting insulin and then 50 to 75% of their long-acting insulin. They fast from midnight, cease their subcut insulin and start the infusion the morning of. The reason why we wouldn't give them their full dose of their long or intermediate acting insulin is because what they're going to deliver, they're going to get a hangover effect of that previously administered insulin because their insulin resistance has abruptly changed. Their insulin state has abruptly changed from being a very insulin resistant one to insulin sensitive. And I'll show you the data for that in a minute. Those women presenting in spontaneous labour, we generally just start the infusion as they walk through the door. This is the insulin infusion that I think is pretty standard, what one that everyone uses, and our cutoff points. In women that are um, high, having hypoglycemia, it always concerns me to see their insulin infusion just being turned off, particularly if they've got no long-acting insulin on board at all, and obviously this runs the risk of ketosis, so I generally recommend that they increase the dose of dextrose or reduce the infusion to 0.5 of a unit or to 0.25 of a unit. Uh, this is also what I would recommend, or this is also what we do for women who are having betamethasone at the end of pregnancy. So we would just continue their subcut dose of insulin because that's what they normally require to cover what they're normally doing. And then we run an insulin infusion over the top. Um, and then once that gets down to the point where they're not requiring much from it, we assume that the effect of betamethasone has worn off. We stop the infusion and they go home. So the postpartum period, again, it's really quite variable. Most people would cease the insulin infusion at delivery and continue dextrose. The alternatives are listed here, so you can reduce the infusion rate, give them some subcut insulin at a smaller dose of their pre-pregnancy or their, their uh, dose with their first meal, or give them a dose based on their postpartum weight. And all of those recommendations are based solely on people's experience and nothing on um, actual evidence. And in fact, in our own Australasian Diabetes and Pregnancy Guidelines, there are no targets and in the postpartum period for what sugars and no guidelines. And all it says is to avoid hypoglycemia. Some may say that our guidelines are then not much worth. <laughs> so in the postpartum period, what we do at the Royal is that the vaginal deliveries, we would cease in their insulin and dextrose infusion unless, of course, they had a BGL of over 10. Cease their IV fluids, unless, of course, they were hypoglycemic or unable to tolerate a diet. And a similar situation, the caesarean, but to just continue their fluids until they're tolerating a diet or if they've got an epidural in situ. We monitor their sugars and then restart their sugars when they restart their insulin, sorry, when their sugars are over about eight at about 50% of the pre pregnancy dose. And again, this was just based on what we thought was right rather than us actually having any data for this. So what's actually happening in this postpartum period? So immediately in this postpartum period, women have been noted to have what has been referred to as an apparent period of transient insulin independence, where these women with type 1 diabetes, after they deliver a baby, sometimes just don't require insulin for a brief period of time. Sometimes that's a couple of hours, but in other cases it's even a couple of days and every institution has at least one or two bona fide type 1 diabetics who have gone a few weeks postpartum without needing insulin. And we are yet to explain how that phenomenon occurs. So this is actually relatively poorly reported in the literature. So if you ask any obstetric medicine physician, they'll say, absolutely, women with type 1 can have this period of insulin independence. And when you look for the data behind it, there's really not much. So there's only these two studies that had been previously reported. And this first one by Kaplan et al. was quite a small study, and it had 23 patients. And they showed that five of their 23 patients didn't require additional insulin on the day of delivery. And over the next couple of days, the majority of women required less than their pre-pregnancy dose. But they didn't have any insulin, any information concerning prior doses, breastfeeding, or time of commencement. And Lean et al. showed a similar thing, but they showed a difference in the method of delivery um, in, in terms of time to insulin requirements. So we looked at this uh, in, our, in our institutions, and these were the factors that we looked at to see what predicts earlier or later use of insulin or requirement for insulin in the postpartum period. And so these were the factors that we found to be significant. So uh, later requirement of insulin, so women that went for a longer period postpartum without needing insulin were those women who were leaner, so they had a lower BMI at term, those women who had a higher creatinine, and that may not have been overt renal impairment, but just a higher creatinine. 
if they'd had a shorter time from their last long-acting insulin, if they'd been continued on the insulin infusion postpartum, and if they had hyperglycemia postpartum, which sort of makes sense. So there are a number of factors that could affect the women's insulin requirements in the postpartum period. As we know, the pharmacokinetic profile of insulin is affected by the dose method site of administration, regional blood flow, lipohypertrophy, and we've looked at some of these factors and couldn't find any relationship um, between time to first requirement of insulin and vasodilatory agents. Similarly, insulin antibodies can affect, so we don't think that the first one is it, insulin antibodies can also affect the pharmacokinetics in some studies, but the majority of people show no relationship between insulin antibodies and BGLs. And nowadays, insulin antibodies are far less common given the use of recombinant uh, insulin and with improved purification, so that's not it. So renal and hepatic clearance. So our study suggested that renal clearance may be involved. And renal clearance is of importance to people with type 1 diabetes because they can develop preeclampsia. And this can actually, as you well know, transiently get worse before it gets better in the postpartum period. And they can also develop progression or de novo diabetic nephropathy. Only one woman in our study had gross liver function abnormalities, and so we couldn't really assess the role for renal hepatic clearance, or sorry, hepatic clearance in affecting the time to first requirement of insulin. And finally, it could be insulin resistance. And this is what I suggested slightly earlier in the talk, that the temporal relationship between how suddenly you cut off or change your insulin state from being really insulin resistant to being really insulin sensitive suggests that you could have this prolongation of the pharmacological action of insulin. And a few things from our study supported this. So women who'd had a longer duration of insulin, um, uh, sorry, a, 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 a longer they would had their long-acting insulin a shorter time before they delivered, required insulin for a longer period of time after. Those women who were on a pump, and so they had no long-acting insulin on board, so it suggested its prolongation of the pharmacological half-life of long-acting insulin the, and the increased BMI because they're more insulin resistant. So that could be it. As for endogenous insulin production, there was a study a couple of years ago that suggested that women, again, with, with well-established type 1 diabetes may suddenly start to produce small amounts of insulin at the end of pregnancy. And this, however, was not confirmed, as exciting as it was, in a previous and probably in a subsequent and probably better control study. So we don't think that that's it. So we're left with clearance and insulin resistance. So in terms of how much insulin do we start? I've told you what we do at the Royal, which is about 50%. But what's the evidence for this? Well, if we look in this early postpartum period, which is of the interest to this audience, we can see that women require either the same amount or less than their pre-pregnancy insulin requirements, and that there may not be a significant difference. Um, in terms of if you look at breastfeeding women, their pre and post, they also require less or the same amount of insulin, a similar situation in artificial feeding women. And when you compare the breastfeeding to the artificial women, it's either the same or it's reduced. So the waters are very muddy in terms of the literature here. And in the later postpartum period, for interest sake only, it's much the same. So we think that their insulin requirements are still probably a bit reduced. But none of these studies were particularly well conducted or very large studies, and there are a couple of other issues with them. So the recommencement dose, when we looked at this in our, in our study population, we showed considerable variability in glucose in this postpartum period. And concerningly, 95% of women had at least two sugars uh, that were less than three and a half or more than 10 in the time from delivery until discharge. And of those, 60% had at least one hypoglycemic episode. And when we look at this in terms of, well, how much insulin should we start them on? This number between 50 and 60 seems to be a good one. So if you start someone on 50 to 60 percent of their insulin postpartum, it actually results in a few number of BGLs out of range and no hypoglycemic episodes. So why am I telling you this when you're not starting insulin? I'm telling you this because 30 percent of people in our tertiary centre were actually commenced on greater than their pre-pregnancy dose of insulin. And the dose actually correlated with who the healthcare provider was physician versus obstetrician. So the obstetricians were the issue, unfortunately. So all the women who were started on greater than their pre-pregnancy dose of insulin were done so by the obstetricians. All the women that were started on less than their pre-pregnancy dose were started on by physicians or some obstetricians did that. 
And so I would put it to you that when you're seeing your women on day one post to review their epidural, have a quick look at their insulin chart for me and see what dose of insulin they've been started on because this is actually significant. We had one woman not that long ago at one of the other Brisbane hospitals who was started on her term pregnancy dose of insulin. She went to visit her baby in special care who'd been there because of shoulder dystocia and she collapsed and had a hypoglycemic seizure on the floor of the NICU. And she was just lucky because she had an unrecordable BGL at the time of fitting. So this does have implications and particularly with the early discharge from hospital, it's important that I think we're all vigilant as to are these women getting the best care that they should be. So in conclusion, a fall in insulin requirements in late gestation, let's exclude placental insufficiency but it may not be pathological and certainly we should hold our horses before we jump to delivering these women. Good glycemic control at that time of delivery is actually very important and we should think about delivering these women if they are hyperglycemic at the time that they're hitting the table. Insulin infusion is best management um, or the most common management at the time of delivery. And in this postpartum period, insulin requirements fall immediately after delivery and women can have a period where they don't require insulin for days, um, for hours or days after delivery and we should be restarting insulin at about half of the pre-pregnancy dose. Thank you. Thank you Naomi for a third excellent talk. I would like to invite all the speakers to come up to the table now um, and we've got a couple of questions that have come through and then I'll ask um, uh, the audience whether you've got any other questions to, to go forward. Thank you. So firstly just starting Dr Bogod um, with you. Um, there's a question, could Dr Bogod please comment on the need or otherwise to wipe the skin after preparation and drying because of the risk of glove contamination during palpation and subsequent contamination of the needle or catheter during handling? Well, yeah, we, uh, we haven't given an opinion on this one because yeah. there's really no evidence at all. The, 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 um, what evidence we have suggests we should allow the chlorhexidine to dry. Although some have said that in doing so, of course, you increase the concentration of chlorhexidine on the skin because the alcohol mm -hmm. evaporates. Uh, but it seems to be good practice to allow the chlorhexidine to dry, uh, at which point, of course, you shouldn't get any liquid contamination on your, on your hands at all. And that's before even palpating, uh, mm -hmm. not just injecting. But uh, the, the, the question of whether to wipe uh, is as yet open. Um, on that related note, could I ask you, there's been quite a lot published, particularly from the UK, around the so-called rapid sequence spinal. <laughs> Would you like to comment on that for us? Because that doesn't seem to allow a lot of time for drying, from what I could see. Well, yeah, now the rapid sequence spinal is, of course, the, is the, is the um, uh, uh, in, not the invention, but the formalisation of, mm. of a technique, which I think a lot of people use, is to you know, mm. get a spinal in quickly for a category one cesarean section. But the, the guy who's um, popularised it is, um, is Mike Kinsella, and you, you probably don't know him around these parts, but he is the most careful man in existence. He epitomises the careful anaesthetist, and it's really quite a surprise to see something like this coming from someone like him. And it immediately made me think, if he's recommending it, it, this, it must be safe. His argument uh, in the face of all the questions about cutting corners is that mm. you cut, a corn, cut corners when you do a crash general anaesthetic for caesarean section. Mm. And his, his argument is entirely that the, the risk-benefit uh, uh, ratio is better uh, doing cr cutting corners with your spinal than cutting corners with your general. And in that, he's probably right. Just to clarify, the rapid sequence spinal refers to really basically just putting on a pair of gloves and one wipe with chlorhex and alcohol without any of the other preparations and obviously potentially limited, but it does potentially avoid the, the need for a general anaesthetic. Yeah. David, did you want to comment on that? I was just going to say, I think the, the, the key thing about the rapid sequence spinal is, is not just the, the, uh, the quick preparation, mm -hmm. but is also not to persist if you can't get it in on the mm. first go. I mean, that, that, that's where you really run into problems and where you're, where quite rightly the obstetricians are reluctant to kind of give you the go ahead to do that if they mm. think that that's gonna start this sequence of, of procrastination while you have repeated attempts. Yes, and Mike, Mike lays a lot of store on the need to be pre oxygenating the patient, mm. to, to have drugs prepared and, and to, to allow yourself one, essentially one go and one reorientation. Yeah, no, fair enough. Thank you. 
Um, the other question that's come through, again for Dr Bogod, um, is if the uh, drape um, covering near the aperture is wet by the chlorhexidine, does that then compromise the sterility? Crikey. <laughs> That's, a, that's, a, that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I don't know. The, I mean, the drapes we're using nowadays, generally in the UK, are single-use uh, 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 disposable drapes, uh, and they don't seem to have any absorbent property at all. So uh, I, I guess certainly the ones we use have a sticky edge with a, mm -hmm. uh, around uh, a window, and we wouldn't adhere that to the patient's back until the antiseptic was already dry, so there wouldn't be any question of contamination. But I guess I can imagine a situation where uh, gravity could could mm. draw some uh, antiseptic down from a, a soaked uh, a, a soaked. It's all about good technique in the end, isn't it? I think uh, and, be, and being sensible, all of which goes slightly out the window with rapid sequence spinal, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, at this point, does anyone else have any other questions for any of our speakers? Uh, just to rephrase the question, I believe you're asking, you're noticing in the pack that the syringe for the spinal injection had a lure lock, whereas the local anaesthetic did not. And the needle for the spinal injection had a lure slip. Lure slip, sorry. Yeah, that was, um, I should have, I should have, skip through that slide a little more quickly than that. No, they will, it, the, the, way, the reason that we, those, those syringes that I showed you were ones that we were able to source nearly 12 months ago and it has taken close to 12 months to get lure lock ones and yes, they will, be, they will be definitely be lure lock uh, in that pack as will, as will both the loss of resistance, uh, uh, sorry, we're not allowed to call it a loss of resistance syringe, the loss of resistance device and the 20 mil uh, epidural uh, local anaesthetic syringe in the epidural pack will also be lure lock. So, e e we, I mean, there's personal preference. We use lure lock for for everything, um, and that and that'll be in those customised packs. Uh, there was another question. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a hard question, and there's really no good evidence. Sorry, just oh, if I oh, sorry, just to, just yeah, so the, to reiterate the question as to how long okay. should we delay them if we're going to delay elective cesareans if they come in with poor glycemic control? Um, I think that that's it's hard because there's really not much in the way of evidence around it. But we know that the changes from islets actually can hurt, occur quite quickly. So if you take rats, and I'm not suggesting that pregnant women are rats, um, although having been pregnant three times, you sort of feel like one, um, that if you infuse a glucose infusion into a, into a rat, within 24 hours, they've almost doubled their islet cell mass. So the changes can occur really quite quickly. Um, and similarly, their islet cell mass reduces back down quickly. So it's, we're talking in days. Um, and even in pregnancy, normal pregnancy, so not in the type 1 population, you do get a significant degree of hyperplasia and hypertrophy of islet cells to account for the increased demands of, of insulin requirements in a normal pregnancy. And those changes have been documented in autopsy studies of women who have died at the time of delivery. And if you look shortly after delivery, so within days to a week or so, those islet changes have again dramatically reversed. So we could extrapolate that it, it's not going to take very long. So if we looked at even 24 hours, potentially 48, I guess it depends on how bad the glycemic control is, um, then that should improve their, their neonatal hypoglycemia. But that's something that I think really should be looked at in a study. I think that that would be a good study to, to do because a lot of these women, their, their day of caesarean is purely arbitrary. You know, they're delivered somewhat around the 38-week mark, but whether it's a Monday or a Tuesday is not going to make much difference to anybody. Um, so I think that we should do a study looking specifically at that and the, the rate of neonatal hypoglycemia. Just on a slightly related note, 
the other way. Um, with the gestational diabetics, we certainly seem to have quite an issue in our hospital that if they're not on insulin but they come in and they're fasting for the six hours and we check their sugars, they're often low. Yeah. Um, and it, could you explain why that happens and how low are we worried about? Yeah, so I think, I mean, as we know, fetuses compensate for hypoglycemia better than what they do for hyperglycemia. So I think from a fetal side of things, it's not too much of an issue. Um, with pregnancy, it's, it's loosely co considered to be a state of accelerated starvation. So pregnant women become ketotic quite quickly if, they, if they're fast. And I think that that's the reason why we see these women becoming hypoglycemic mm -hmm. more easily. Um, so I don't think that that necessarily is something that we should worry about. And certainly I haven't seen any literature to suggest that that's associated with any adverse outcome. Um, and certainly from the, the woman's side of things, it all rebounds very quickly after they deliver. Certainly. Because our practice has been to treat anything under four. Would that be your recommendation yeah. or you'd be happier to lower numbers? So, I mean, treating under four, I think, is, is a safe guideline. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the, the most recent publications out of um, the Endocrine Society on what we consider a hypoglycemic mm -hmm. episode, it is four has been the cutoff. And previously we were using three or three and a half. Mm -hmm. But I think four is certainly safe. But then avoiding a rebound hyperglycemia is important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. Hell no, you, you guys don't have any national guidelines yet. I think um, the, the trouble, always the problem. Yeah, you probably will, and they may well, and they, and they may well follow ours. But our, uh, our alcoholic chlorhexidine is tinted pink as well, so you can actually, you can't quite see so easily where it's been applied. But, but it, it is, it's not a difficult thing to add tint to, a, to, to, to an antiseptic solution. Yeah. Because it's really brown, and you can see it even with your eyesight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not bad practice yet. <laughs> it, 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 uh, and after all, in, in, the, in, the, in the United States, everyone's using 2% chlorhexidine or, or povidone iodine, so hardly anyone's using 0.5% there. So we're either ahead of the curve in the UK or, yet again, we're getting it wrong. So who knows? Uh, and actually, the spinal connectors is a very good example of that because, you know, this is, it's a totally UK-based uh, proposition, the spinal connector thing. And, and a lot of hospitals have changed in the UK successfully to do non-Lewis spinal connectors, but very few have gone as far as uh, the um, epidural route because it's just that much more complicated and because we're now all waiting for the international standards to come through. Thank you. Uh, question? Thank you. There's two Davids. You're going to have to be more specific. He would have called you Dr. Bogart. He just calls me David. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I, I, I would... I'd have to say I'm on I'm on her side or her, her his side, Rob, because I I mean the the, the red syringes really were designed for uh, for muscle relaxants and um, and uh, I mean everyone has individual quirks in their practice. My concern is that it's not it's not with you when you're practicing on on your own. It's when your registrar comes in uh, and then that's when that's when the con the confusion uh, happens. So I mean I think the yellow, I mean the international standard for neuraxial colouring is yellow and, and so I think that is a, uh, once they're available that would be a, a better way to go. Just on that note, do you think we should be having yellow syringes in, this, in the tray, say, I'm sorry, not in the tray, in the Morgan trolley uh, for when we're giving doses apart from the initial administration? Correct, and, and, the, right. and they'll be available as standalone um, packs the same way as the red syringes mm -hmm. standalone. I think yeah. Alan's got a question. Uh, Dr. Pandey. Tony? Mm -hmm. 
You know, sterilised labels are, are, uh, are another way to go. It adds another, it adds an, it adds another step where it can um, introduce some, uh, some complication. And it's been shown that, that from those studies looking at, uh, looking at, at slip, what's called slip lapse errors, we are very good, our brains are very good at stopping us from giving the wrong agent, providing it's been correctly drawn up into a coloured, in, into something with colour, we're not good at, at reading. So we, we our, bra it's, uh, our brains read what we want to read and we go ahead and give it, that's the problem. Um. We've recently had an incident in the UK, actually in Nottingham, I'll be honest with you, uh, where our radiologists uh, uh, had a, a really ghastly incident where they injected uh, some beads which are designed to occlude a blood vessel uh, instead of saline. Uh, from a sterile tray, from unlabeled syringes, and which caused a, a catastrophic result. Um, and apparently, uh, if you look through the literature, this isn't unusual in radiology. Uh, and since then, we're now working on having sterile labels for our, our syringes on trays as well. So it just seems wrong that we label everything else apart from the sterile syringes on the tray. I mean, my most significant drug error I've ever made was giving, re, having a syringe of midazolam, sorry, having a syringe of vecuronium, labelled vecuronium correctly, reading it, and then giving it to a woman in the anaesthetic bay because I wanted to give midazolam and my brain read midazolam. Yeah. Um, and, it's just, and that was before the days of red plunger syringes. And that's disappeared. That problem is just gone now. We haven't got red syringes. That sounds like a really sensible idea. We've got time for one final question. Um, if there's none from the floor, there's just one final one here. Uh, this, this is to Naomi. Uh, do we feel that we should interfere with patients' pump management or allow them to do it themselves? Look, um, I think that there's two, there's two issues with pump management. One is not just the patient, but one is the, the nursing staff and everyone else's how comfortable they are. And in a lot of institutions, there just aren't that many women on pumps. So I think that's one side of it. Um, in terms of interfering. Generally, we advocate that we will do the dosing in the postpartum period because women have a lot on their mind. They're really preoccupied. Um, and so we prefer to dose them in their postpartum period, at least for their basal rate. Um, and in the pumps, what we generally do is to restart their basal first and then to add a bolus if that's needed. And once we're getting to the stage that we're adding bolus dosing, usually that's about a day or two down the track. Um, and, and that's when we tend to let the women take over if they want to. Um, one interesting thing with the, the pump women that I, I sort of glossed over in the study was that the all the pump women that we had in our study, and we didn't have many, but all the one, women that we did have had no time off insulin. Um, so they're the group that I think we have to watch a little bit more closely in the postpartum period, um, that they may require their insulin sooner, um, if not from delivery. Thank you. Um, just prior to thanking the speakers, I've just got one housekeeping thing, which is for those who are going to the night at the movies, it starts at 7 o'clock tonight and the buses will leave from out the front of the exhibition centre um, at 6.30pm. So at this point I'd just like to thank our three speakers for their excellent talks um, and um, so we'll see you at the time. Thank you. Look, um, Lassie, we've got one more obstetric session on Tuesday, which is more of an update. Um, please come along. Thanks very much. <laughs>